Hi there. Good morning. And I'm on with my ICSC um, lessons. And today I'm planning to take up The Patriot by Robert Browning. This is uh, one of his um, famous uh, dramatic monologues. Uh, of course, apart from The Last Duchess. Um, and in this you have uh, the patriot of a country being treated like a hero first and then like a zero leader. So let's take up the first stanza and uh, try to understand it in detail. The patriot, it was roses, roses all the way with myrtle mixed in my path like mad. The house roof seemed to heave and sway. The church spires flamed. Such flags they had a year ago on this very day. So the event that the narrator is describing is something that happened a year ago. All right? And um, he's being accorded a hero's welcome here. Obviously, he has accomplished something for his country, maybe won uh, some uh, laurels in battle, and he's the homecoming hero. And so this particular place he belongs to, they have just uh, laid out literally um, the red carpet, so to speak, for him. He's being given a hero's welcome. And there they are, the crowd, packed everywhere. And they are throwing flowers, particularly roses, as he walks down the path. And uh, roses symbolize, you know, love. Whenever you love somebody, you give that person roses. Valentine's Day, right? So roses here symbolizes love. For this patriot who's coming back to his country, town, wherever. And they're also throwing myrtles. Now, myrtles symbolize loyalty. So this is a kind of right combination. The roses and myrtle shard on him as he walks along. And uh, the people are crowded everywhere, including there are uh, spectators or people standing on the rooftops and uh, it, it, you know the kind of uh, the houses give this impression of kind of uh, moving because of the milling people on top and they're all kind of trying to catch a view of this fantastic hero in their midst this man who's returning after having achieved so much for them. And the church spires, you know that all the churches have this kind of dome on top and then it has this tall spire. And so the spires are just alight with all the flags that they had attached there, fastened out there. So the, and all this had happened a year ago. And our hero, has noted all these things. And in this first stanza, you have visual images presented to you. The whole thing is visual. The sight of flowers, the man walking down the path, the crowds, and the houses uh, creating this effect of swaying and heaving. Uh, the church spires flaming with all those flags. We truly get a very, very visual perception of the scene. Stanza 2. The air broke into a mist with bells. The old walls rocked with a crowd and cries. Had I said, good folk, mere noise repels. But give me your son from yonder skies. They had answered. And afterwards, what else? Now, in this particular stanza, please note 
the images are all auditory you can hear sounds the thunderous sound of the multitudes of people gathered there and the sound of bells the church bells being rung showing you know how welcome he is to announce his arrival and the old walls it's completely it's echoing and re-echoing with the cries the cheering of the crowd gathered there and the poet the narrator the patriot gets the feeling that at that time when the he was experiencing the adulation of the crowds at its height his people the adoration they were kind of offering him if he had asked them you know for something impossible like even the sun from the skies they would have got it for him they would have just gone out of the way and got it for him they were so 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 grateful thankful delighted filled with adoration and adulation for him and so he says if i had asked for the sun they would have given me the sun and then they would have said what else do you want tell us all right and afterwards what else and now we move on to stanza three alack it was i who leapt at the sun to give it my loving friends to keep not man could do have i left undone and you see my harvest what i reap this very day now a year is run so there you are a lack that exclamation itself gives another twist to the story something horrible has happened in that one single year to change the mind of the fickle minded crowd his people and he says a lack he realizes that it was he who had leapt at the sun it was he who had wanted to fetch something as impossible as the sun for his people he had gone for the sun to give it to them for keeps he wanted to achieve accomplish the impossible for his people and what was the use he had done everything he could that a man could possibly do everything he had done his utmost to give them the best and then he says ironically look at my harvest look what i got in return what did i reap take a look there is no more gratitude the crowd had changed its attitude and uh, this particular stanza uh, brings to mind sorry i need my cup of tea to keep going excuse me let me have a sip all the better to explain right a teacher drinks tea all right now stanza 3 uh, i'm reminded of the story of icarus particularly when uh, you know Uh, the patriot asked for the son now icarius and his father they were imprisoned in a tower in a high tower and uh, they were going to be put to death i think and uh, icarius's father he wanted his son to escape and so he made this made these wings out of wax don't ask me where he got the wax from i have no clue but he made these wings with wax attached it to his to the back of his son just like the wings of a bird and he told his son to fly across the sea and escape but he gave a warning don't go too near the sun and that was rightfully said because as you know wax will melt in the heat now if icarus had 
heeded to his father's words, perhaps he would have survived. But he didn't. When he started flying, he took off from the tower. He was so excited by the glory of flying. It felt so good that he went higher and higher and close to the sun. He altogether forgot his father's advice. And uh, unfortunately, the wax melted and he fell into the sea and poor Icarus drowned. And that is what happened to him. Now back to our hero, the patriot here. There is nobody, stands up for. There is nobody on the housetops now, one year later. There is nobody on the uh, housetops now, just a palsy few at the windows set. For the best of the sight is all the love, everybody believes, at the shambles gate. Or better still, by the very scaffold's foot, I throw. All right. Now, our patriot is walking the walk of shame. Okay? Uh, no, don't let me remind you of Game of Thrones. You have the walk of shame there too. And uh, the people on the housetops were now no longer there. There was nobody. And only, excuse me, my tuition kid has a doubt. Yes. Kavish loudly so that people can hear you. Why is he ashamed of Jesus? Why hmm. is he having a shameful walk? It is a, it's day? called a walk of shame. Yeah, right. It's not a shameful walk for him. He's proud. He's proud of what he has done uh, for the country, the patriot. But he's being led somewhere. And he's being punished for whatever the crowd has perceived as his bad deeds. And so they are leading him to be executed. I'm jumping a bit here, but they are leading him to be executed. Right? And that is called... What wrong has he done? Nobody knows. But obviously in the perception of his people, within that year, they had managed to perceive his actions as wrong. And that is how fickle-minded people are. And this is called a walk of shame because they are leading him to the executioner, to the shambles gate, the place where he is going to be executed. All right? So as he walks, there is nobody to see him. And that's a total contrast to the hero's welcome he got uh, in the previous year with people crowding even on the terraces to see him and on the pavements and throwing roses and myrtles, all right, symbolizing their love for him. But that was not happening today. He was being led and if at all there were people at the window, they were only people who suffered from some disease or the other, old, old people who could not walk to the executioner's ground, to the scaffold, um, scaffold, all right? You get the picture? So that is called the walk of shame. And it was believed by the crowd that the best view, they believed it all allowed means Everyone felt that the best view would be at the shambles gate, the place where the execution is going to take place. They didn't want, you know, to look from the terrace and whatnot. They wanted to be as near the scene as possible. They wanted to watch the execution. You know how sadistic crowds can be sometimes. So there they were, they were punishing him. And then some felt that it is even better to stand right near the scaffold. And scaffold is the platform in which the executioner stands, either with the axe and then chops off the wrongdoer's head, or if it is a place where the wrongdoer is hanged, 
there will be the news all right and they will kind of put a mask on his head and hang him until death that's what happens so people were crowding there to watch this same patriot whom they had worshipped a year earlier die they wanted to see him put to death all right we move on is it clear kavish yes ma'am thank you the fifth stanza now i go in the rain and more than needs a rope cuts both my wrist behind and i think by the feel my forehead bleeds for they fling whoever has a mind stones at me for my years misdeeds he's not specifying here what the misdeeds are because he has not done anything he is in fact an innocent man it is the crowd his people who are interpreting his actions as wrong as against their law you understand and so he walks down the path he is being led mind you his wrists are bound and they are bound so tightly behind him that it cuts into him all right it literally cuts into him yeah into the wrist so tightly they have bound him that he can feel it and you have tactile imagery here touch he can feel it and then you know he can feel the 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 blood slowly you know flowing down his forehead because whoever feels like it is stoning him the crowds are literally throwing stones pelting him with stones they are punishing him and that is why it's called a walk of shame so whoever felt like throw stones at him and he was in a terrible position and there was no way he could explain anything to anybody because the situation was far gone and he knew that death was certain and this crowd was not going to accept anything and now a sip of tea if you don't mind you know i always get this feeling that my explanations are better when i have these little sips of tea i hope you don't mind as a viewer kavish doesn't mind he's used to my ways all right now we move on to stanza 5 and the poor patriot is being led all right to the scaffold the platform where he's going to be killed hanged or maybe axed to death we don't know but um, that's stanza 6 ha huh, now we are going to stanza 6 i'm sorry 5 is over thank you kavish uh thus i entered and thus i go is the explanation quite clear kavish yeah. you're able to visualize the whole thing yes, yes? all right uh thus i entered and thus i go in triumphs people have dropped down dead all right so this is the way i've entered and this is how i go and here he is also referring uh, symbolically to his birth that's how he entered the earth with hopes of accomplishing many things with hopes of doing good and now this is how he's going he's going to die right in a terrible manner though he was innocent in triumphs people have dropped down dead now he's talking about people who have dropped dead in spite of their victory because maybe they are overwhelmed by their victory and the crowd is just heaping rewards on them praising them them to the skies for whatever they've achieved and at that moment of glory they have just dropped down dead it happens too much happiness is also not good all right and then 
God asks them a specific questions. Paid by the world, what dost thou owe me? God might question. And why would God ask this peculiar question? Because from the God's point of view, it's something like this. The one who has achieved victory on earth, a temporal victory on earth, has already been rewarded, recognized by people. Now such a man, what more? What has he done for God? What did he owe God? Think of the situation. Whenever we are down in dumps and things have gone wrong for us, who do we call? We call God. If we feel we have done something wrong, we say, God have mercy on me. Right? That is the cornerstone of any religion where you beg for forgiveness to God. Right? Now, a person who has achieved everything in the world and whom people are celebrating and there is so much rejoicing and he is suitably rewarded, is he going to think of God in this moment of triumph? Is he going to ask for forgiveness? No. But a man who is walking to the scaffold will definitely think of God. And he will pray to God to forgive him for whatever sins he has committed on earth. So, when a very victorious man stands in front of God after death, God is bound to ask him, what have you paid me? What do you owe me? You've not even thought about me. But in the case of the patriot, definitely God will forgive him, even if he has done something wrong. And um, not only that, the patriot is completely reassured that God will repay him. God will give him what he deserves for his actions on earth. He will never be misinterpreted or blamed by God. And therefore, he will be safer in the folds of God's presence. I think this poem is absolutely mind-blowing, especially the last stanza. It took me time to understand the last stanza. Now, why had God suddenly come into the picture? It's so natural. When a man dies, he will think of God. I don't know if it has made sense to you, but this dramatic monologue from Robert Browning uh, communicates a lot to me. Uh, my takeaways from this particular poem would be, one, how fickle the world is. No matter what you do, what you achieve for people, the utmost you do, sometimes they forget, they misunderstand, they punish you for it. So don't expect justice on earth. Justice is something, true justice is something that you will only get from God. And that was my biggest takeaway from this particular poem. Right? Thanks so much for listening to me. And now I think I will deal with uh, covetous doubts. And if you have any doubts, if you have any comments to make, please feel free to do so. All right, in my channel. And I will definitely get back to you. And there is also another thing that I would like to tell you. Uh, I have this study aid going uh, for class 10. It's called The Star Companion uh, to Treasure Trove. You will find my analysis of all the stories and poems and you will find it in uh, Amazon.in, Flipkart, etc. etc. 
So thank you for listening to me and bye for now.